Good morning, uh, boys, girls, geeks of all ages. Um, welcome to Care and Feeding of a Healthy Job Hunt. I am your presenter today, VM Brasseur, but because we're all friends here, you can call me Vicky. So if you walk up to me and you see my badge, that's how you pronounce VM. Um, you can find me on Twitter at VM Brasseur. I tweet a lot. Um, if you want something a little more immediate, free note IRC, VM Brasseur, kind of consistent here. Email Osbridge2015 at vmbrasseur.com. Ooh, more people. So, why are you listening to me today? Um, I am a software engineering manager and executive. I've been doing this hiring thing for over 10 years, but more importantly, when I was doing freelance, I was doing career coaching for tech professionals. So what you're going to get here are a lot of tips that I've been giving people for a number of years, and I've just kind of gotten sick of repeating them, so now I'm going to record them. In all of my years of management and coaching, the one thing that I have found consistently is that job hunting fucking sucks. Period, dot, end, okay? Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the postings are vague, they're unrealistic, communication on a really good day is really bad, timelines are nebulous and or non-existent, interviewers have absolutely no clue how to do that job. Most of these things are entirely out of your control, but what I hope to give you are some tips which will help to make things just a little better and get you the sort of attention that you want. But before we get started in earnest, I have a few notes. Uh. <laughs> but I know, right? It, that one's for you, Michael. <laughs> um, so uh, there is a whole lot of ground to cover here. I am going to go very, very quickly. There may not be time for questions at the end, but if you need, I can stick around. And as well, I'm going to have an unconference session on Friday where you can ask me all sorts of stuff. Um, what we are going to cover, the ins and outs of job postings, resumes, cover letters, applying, interviewing, negotiating, and if we have time, organizing your job hunt. What we will not cover are career planning and career development. Most of us in this room, I can almost guarantee, still don't know what we want to be when we grow up. This is a very important question that I'm not going to cover. So um, for those of you who have devices, which is everyone, please make sure they are set to mute. And as well, your mileage is going to vary. I'm going to say a lot of things. They're not going to apply to everyone in every sort of situation. So um, just take that with a grain of salt and use them sometimes as more suggestions than law. One more thing, please save all the questions until the very end. If we have time, I will cover them. If not, find me at the conference or somewhere in Portland, because I live here now, booyah. So, let's get going. Job postings. And coffee. Um, so, let's set the stage. What should you expect from job postings? Um, not in the ideal situation, but the real situation. When you start scouting around for your next job, what would the postings be like out there? Unfortunately, you're going to find that these things usually but not always suck. You read them and you're going to look a little like this. You're going to find that a posting is, will have incredibly vague requirements, or perhaps they'll have very specific but excessive requirements, as though a recruiter made a shotgun blast of keywords all over the page. Problem is most companies don't think these things through all the way. Okay? <laughs> Rather than treating hiring like it is, just another project requiring planning and thought, they copy and paste stuff from before. Even worse, a recruiting recruiter will come up to a hiring manager like myself and ask what sort of skills I need for this hire rather than uh, considering the actual problems that I'm going to face now and in the future. I just give them a laundry list of things that might be needed. And what this turns into is a job posting which looks incredibly intimidating and out of reach. Unfortunately, it means that the job postings that do make it out into the wild don't typically reflect the actual needs of the team. And that's because no one has fully thought them through, let alone expressed them in a way which is meaningful to you, the job seeker. Therefore, when you look at just about any job posting, please start from a mental place of these are not requirements, these are nice to haves. When you view them in this light, you will find that postings become much more approachable and less intimidating. So, what this means is that if you see a job posting which is of interest to you and it is in your wheelhouse, just apply for it, even if you don't meet all the requirements. Just do it. You cannot win a race you do not run. As well, deciding whether or not you're a fit for that job is not your job. 
right? This is the problem of the team and the hiring manager. Do not strip them of the opportunity to make a decision just because you suspect you might not be right for that position. Just apply and let them decide. So job postings, where do you find these suckers? There's really the obvious places. You got your Indeed, Craigslist, uh, Stack Overflow, Monster, LinkedIn. You don't mind getting email every single fucking day. <laughs> Um, yeah. As well, there are job boards for your specialized area of interest. Are you in higher ed? Go to the Chronicle of Higher Education. Are you in library? Code for Lib bloody rocks. Advertising marketing? Ad tech. You know, government, healthcare, everybody has their own specialized job board. Use them. They are really useful. But then there's also the less usual suspects. These typically require a lot more work to find, but they often give you the best results. Look at products and services you use and or appreciate. These are the ones upon which I rely every single day. Go to their websites. Do they have anything for you? Maybe they do. You're not gonna know if you don't look. There's also these sponsor pages of conferences you attend. These are companies who believe in and support things that you believe in and support. So they might be good places for you to work. As well, you've got the conferences themselves. A lot of places will send Oh, I just got distracted by knitting. Um, anyway, <laughs> it's a, no, 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 it's a good thing. Um, so a lot of places are going to send recruiters and representatives to conferences as well. Just about everyone here is a representative of an organization. So talk to people and find out about their company, see whether they're hiring. <coughs> Those few minutes could pay off really big for everyone involved. Do you read any industry news sites? Here are some that I read regularly. Um, when companies are mentioned in a favorable way, Look them up, see whether they are hiring, that you can get some really interesting uh, leads that way. Do you support any nonprofits or other organizations? Which companies sponsor or support them? These are companies who believe as you believe and might be good places to work. Also, by doing these things, you're not only finding companies who may have similar beliefs and values to yours, but you're rewarding those companies for the support of those beliefs and values you therefore make sure they're more likely to continue supporting these things. So then there is the best and most effective way of all of finding a new job and that is networking. And every introvert in the crowd just turned a deep shade of white right now. Um, so it's okay. It's not going to be as hard as, or as bad as you think it is because we live in the age of social networking. You can sit in the comfort of your cafe, your pub, your living room, and you can interact with people who can find you your next position. When somebody says stuff you like, either in an article or say on a social network, follow them, interact with them in a professional and respectful manner. Other valuable sources of leads are going to be former coworkers, friends, and family. When you think you're about to start looking, put out those feelers. Say, hey, if anyone hears of anything, these don't have to be just people in technology. Right? These can be people anywhere. Because I know doctors who know people in technology. I know librarians who know people in technology. It doesn't matter. Good jobs are everywhere. So don't just limit this to the technologists in your life. Another option is recruiters. Not all of these are spammers who perform really shitty keyword searches and then spam thousands of unqualified candidates. There are legitimately good recruiters out there. Some of them will reach out to you on LinkedIn. Others you'll just meet through friends. Keep in touch with these people. They're good people to know because they're going to be sending you leads. These are people who legitimately want both the company and you to be happy. So, all right, that was the 50,000 foot view on job postings. We're going to dive into resumes, which is a rather a large section of this. I will, again, go pretty fast. We'll cover pretty much what you should do and what you should not do, and we're going to start right there with what you should never include on your resume. This is very uh, specific to America, for the record. Um, I've looked at probably thousands of resumes in my life. And they, these can be pretty flexible, but there's a lot of shit that if I see it, on your resume, I'm just gonna bin it. Starting with your objective. I'm sorry, I don't fucking care. And that's, that's just the truth of the matter. I'm not hiring so I can enhance your career. I'm hiring because I have a problem to solve. 
So what your objective in your career is doesn't matter to me until after I hire you. Then as a manager, I'm going to help make sure you make that objective. We're going to come up with those goals and move you forward. But beforehand, this is just taking up space. Get rid of it. References available upon request. Other useful, similarly useful things to put on your resume. Sky is blue, water is wet. Right? We all know if I want references, I'm just going to ask you and you will give them. Please don't put this on your resume. It just takes up space. Along those lines, never, ever, ever give me your references in advance. Number one, this is incredibly presumptuous. Most people don't go checking your references until the very end, so don't give them in advance. Furthermore, do you know how terrible this is for the privacy of the contact information of your references? Right, so don't go sending this out in advance. Um, as well, before you send out references, you should contact them, not only asking permission, but also telling them, hey, here's the situation, I need a reference. Here's the position, here's the people I've talked to. So you can set them up and give you the best reference possible. And then you have a photo. Oh my God, no. Please, for the love of dog, don't include this on your resume. In many cultures, it is normal to include a headshot on your CV. America is not one of them. Never do this in the USA unless you are in theater or a model or something like that, right? If you send me with a photo with a resume with a photo on it, what you've just done to me, the hiring manager, is you put me at risk of a discrimination lawsuit, right? I'm not going to care what you look like personally, but that's just me. Other people aren't so nice. They will actually discriminate upon you based upon your color, your gender, your obvious, you know, whatever they feel like. You have, do you have tattoo on your forehead? That might be a problem for them, right? So don't give people the opportunity to be biased against you. Don't include your photo. Also, do not include anything not having to do with your work and professional life. Right? This includes hobbies, non-work affiliations or clubs, and especially not anything related to religious or political affiliations. Don't do this. Again, you're putting people at risk of discriminating against you. Don't give people information they don't need. Don't mix work and non-work, period, dot, end. I hate this one. Please do not give me a fancy design, right? Just don't do it. Here's the thing, people, save that for your portfolio. Your resume has a minimum of three different audiences. You've got the screener, your HR people, recruiters, you've got the hiring manager and the team, and then you get the one that everybody forgets exists, and that is the automatic document parser. <laughs> it can't do shit with this, right? So don't do it. It's going to lower the visibility of your resume in the application process. Think SEO. Think search engine optimization with your resume. While we're on that subject, <laughs> poor Charlie. Um, yeah, please only stick to black and white. Just, just do it. Yeah, the document parser might be able to read text that you've put in green, but you don't know whether the people who are hiring you will. Some people are colorblind. Please respect that. And it should not need to be said, but it always needs to be reinforced. Never include lies or flexible truths. Never. You should always be honest, or at least technically honest, which we all know is the best kind of honesty. So you have to be truthful, but there is no need to disclose things which will reflect negatively on you. So don't tell lies. Don't be flexible. Just tell people the facts. All right, that's all the negative shit. What should you include? All right, I as a hiring manager, nothing's going to turn my head faster than a bunch of numbers. Love numbers. Um, so not only are they really quick to notice and understand, but having numbers shows me that you care about numbers. You care about taking metrics and seeing how they change. This is really important to me in technology. I love it when people do this stuff. So what sort of numbers should you include? So let's say you're doing coding and you save, uh, by an automation process, you save 50 hours a week of somebody's time. OMG, write that down. That's cool shit. Um, the size of the network you may have maintained, uh, pages of documentation written, hits of visitors per day, percent, of, percent increase in performance, uptime, et cetera. Anything that can give a number to a positive difference that you have made is amazing. 
But sometimes you just don't have numbers, so please tell me results. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I did this is important, but and it made this difference is head turning. Examples for things uh, to include here are projects completed on time and on budget, successful leadership opportunities, and growth achieved for yourself and the organization. Something else you should include are your professional affiliation awards and accreditations. I actually said accreditations right. Um, these should always be listed somewhere on your document. These must be professional. While intensely interesting to me personally, the fact that you are a registered Cicerone, a beer specialist, really, I'm not hiring for that unless I'm hiring for a bar. So don't put it on your resume. I'll get that when I'm conversing with you in the interview. Please also include links. Ev I know, <laughs> OMG, it's like the puns, they never stop. Um, so everyone's gonna Google you, that's what happens. Not only does this make their job easier, but it allows you to control the story if you include the links you want people to go see. These should be professionally relevant things. We all know the obvious ones. You got your blog, portfolio, GitHub, uh, LinkedIn profile, if you do that sort of thing. Um, only things that are professional in nature. For instance, I will list my uh, public Twitter because I do a lot of um, management type tweeting and general bitching about shit. But I don't include my protected Twitter because it's none of their damn business. And then we have the list of technologies and competencies. Again, think SEO. You've got that automated document parser. What do you think it's parsing it into? Make sure you've got these lists. These are keywords. Reorganize the list each time you apply by the order of the technologies most important to that organization to which you are applying. Um, I've seen some folks not only include the uh, technologies, but also their level of competency in it. That is more information than I personally need, and it can backfire on you. If someone wants to know that you know JavaScript and your personal assessment of JavaScript is, oh, I know that much, but really in the real wide, wide world, you've got imposter syndrome and you know that much, right? So don't put that information on there, right? Don't give people information they don't need. So a large percent of the questions I usually get when somebody asks me to edit their resume are, you know, what's the right way to format it? So despite what all of the books, which are shit for the most part, I've got some good ones at the end, all the books and the blog posts tell you there is no one right way to do this. There are, however, some guidelines to consider. Remember what I said about those various audiences, right? The, that automated document parser, it, it can't understand documents with a lot of images and odd typefaces, so keep it simple and keep it functional. Beyond that, though, there's more than one way to do it. I had to get Pearl in there somewhere. Um, uh, one pretty common way to do it is chronological. This is where you list your jobs by the most recent first, and then you put some little, I did this, I did that, duties and responsibilities. This is where you would put your fabulous numbers in here. Um, another is functional to organize by your experience and skills by uh, functional area, say management, leadership, operations, performance, security, what have you. If you are just starting out or you have a large gap in your, in your career, this is a good way to hide it. And then there's a hybrid of the two. You can list jobs in reverse chronological, but skills by functional, or just whatever makes sense for the job and that audience. There is more than one way to do it. However, when you do it, whatever you choose, please make it easy to read or skim. And here's where we get to a little real talk. As a hiring manager, your resume crosses my desk. You are really fucking lucky if you get more than 10 or 15 seconds of my time, period. Unless you have something there that's gonna catch my eye, I'm just gonna move on because I've got a lot of stuff to do. I've got eight meetings a day, and I've got budgets, and I've got all sorts of shit. So make it easy to skim. If you want me to pay attention to it, make it really easy for me to do that. Usability is king in all things, not just in UIs, but also in your resume. That is itself a UI. You don't have to become attached to a single resume format. As a matter of fact, I recommend you have several. And I don't just mean in format, I also mean in content. For instance, I recommend everybody have one really, really long resume. This is the one that you will probably not be getting out into the 
wide, wide world, but it will act as a source of information for other more targeted resumes. Also have a general resume. This is something which isn't targeted, but it does a really good job of showing off your experiences and your talents. This is the document you would put on your website, your blog, your portfolio, something like that. However, keep in mind, if you do publicly post this, I recommend you have this version of your resume not include your address and phone number. And then, ideally, in the perfect world within which we all live, you're going to have a different version of your resume for each position for which you actively apply. Um, this doesn't always happen, but it is a very good idea most of the time. So I mentioned that great, big, long, comprehensive resume. Uh, how does that happen? Do you wait until you have quit your job and you suddenly need to update your resume, and then you just rack your brain for all the shit you've done the last five years? No, absolutely not. Most human brains cannot retain or recall detailed information for that long. Do not save your updating your resume until the moment you need it. So what are you going to do? Use your task tracking system of choice. Have it remind you to revisit and revise your resume I recommend once a month. You sit down on a Saturday with a cup of coffee or a mimosa and you're like, okay, what have I done in the past month? Anything? Hmm. If the answer is yes, add it to your big long resume. If the answer is no, fine. At least you've taken the time to think about it. So you've got multiple versions of your resume. You're sending out a different one to every application and you're updating it frequently. And OMG, WTF, BBQ, what are you going to do? So much to keep track of. I'm sorry, we are in technology. Get that shit into version control. Just, just do it. Um, it will always be there when you need it. You can track all the different versions and the changes, and you never again have to rewrite it from scratch. However, if you are going to do this, I recommend you put it in a private repo because nobody wants unsolicited pull requests on their resume. <laughs> Maybe you do. I don't. All right, so that's resumes. Um, Let's talk a little bit about cover letters, which are a surprisingly controversial subject among hiring managers and interviewers. Some people find them to be a complete waste of time and won't even look at them. Other people love them and require them, and I am in that camp. Let me tell you why. Your resume is showing me what you know, what you've done. Your cover letter is telling me who you are. And I'm sorry, I'm not hiring resumes, I'm hiring people. So I absolutely require cover letters so I can get some sense of who you are as a human being. So that's one purpose of a cover letter. Another is to give you the opportunity to tell me why I should even pay attention to your application. Again, I'm a hiring manager. I have problems, otherwise I wouldn't be hiring, right? I need somebody to fix things, to do more. What are you going to do to improve the lives of myself and of my team? The cover letter gives you a chance to explain that. So before you start crafting your cover letter, do a little research. Figure out, obviously, the name of the company, the company's mission, a list of the staff who work there, uh, knowledge on the products they provide, goals of the product and companies, any problems they seem to have had, any accomplishments they've had. Let's say they just got funding or something like that. You know, do a little research. You'll need to do some web spelunking to gather all of this. Um, company website is an obvious place to start. Uh, there's also blogs, Crunchbase, LinkedIn, Twitter, news articles, Glassdoor, you know, pretty much you hit Google and you find all the things. Uh, there's not a lot to say about the format of your cover letter, aside from the fact that, I'm sorry, this is a letter. <laughs> Please format it as such. You don't have to go full on a, a silly business letter format with like three addresses and special indentation. No, no, no. At least have, ooh, we go off the top here. Um, I don't know if somebody can push that down a little. Um, but at least have your salutation, your body, and your closing um, in every letter. I apologize for not noticing that earlier. Um, as well, most online application systems only give you a text area for entering your cover letter. Um, please, therefore, try and keep it only to plain ASCII without any formatting. Don't use HTML, Markdown, anything like that. As well, if you are going to put something fancy in there like, say, bullet lists or a table, um, keep in mind that you've got the space versus tab issue. You also have monospace versus um, non monospace what's that called well, I just don't uh, pardon proportional. proportional thank you swenson yeah so don't do that don't go put in weird tables and stuff like that because it's not going to look the same at the other end ideally each position for which you apply 
is going to get its own unique cover letter. As a hiring manager, I can tell when somebody is just doing a pump and dump of cover letters and resumes to everyone. I, I can tell that. If it's a well-written cover letter, I might let, let it slide. But otherwise, I would rather you do just a little bit of customization. It doesn't have to be much. So you can come up with a really good cover letter and use it as a template and edit and customize it for each specific job. One thing you should always do is customize the salutation. I was in email marketing for six years, um, and I probably could dig up for you plenty of studies that show that you get much, much, much better results with an email, with a letter, if you say, hello, Julie, and put a first name in there, right? That's all it really takes. Do a little research. Discover the name of the hiring manager. Not only does it appeal to the reader, but it shows that you've already put effort into this position. Sometimes the job posting is going to tell you who the hiring manager is, but usually not. Therefore, creep on the company website, LinkedIn, Crunchbase, Google. If you can't find it, go to the nearest grand boss. So let's say Stephen is hiring. I can't figure out it's Stephen, but I can figure out that there's a VP above him. I'll address it to the VP. As long as I am positive. Oh, <laughs> I know, right? Um, and if nothing else, look up the company and see whether the uh, employees have cute little names for themselves, like Googlers or Mozillans or something like that. Um, just put some effort in. The style of the letter can range from formal to casual. Um, gauge your audience and use the style which is most appropriate. For something uh, more corporate, a large corporation, you probably want more formal. For just an early stage startup, more casual is good. You know, know your audience and target it appropriately as far as the wording. When in doubt, default to more formal. Regardless of the level of formality, use your natural writing voice when composing the letter. Don't put on airs, just be yourself, be respectful, be honest. Remember, I'm hiring people, I'm looking at this to see what sort of person you are. So be yourself. So in constructing the content of your letter, remember, it is not about you. It is what you can do for me. Do not regurgitate your resume. I'm already gonna be looking at that. Instead, tell the reader how you can help me. Um, I'm hiring again because I have problems to solve, and how are you going to make a difference in that? Tell me that in your cover letter. Cover letter is also a really good place to anticipate and answer any questions that you know will come up in the process, such as, let's say you live in Philadelphia, and you're applying for a job in DC. Are you willing to relocate? I'm gonna ask. So just put that in your cover letter, and I'll know in advance. Have you been out of work for 18 months? Well, drop a really super quick line in there saying, yeah, I'm just getting back to work after taking care of an ailing uh, parent. Bam, done, they don't need any details, just, but now I know, oh, that's why there's a gap in your resume. All right. You can do that sort of thing in your cover letter very quickly. Don't troll me, Stephen, don't be that man in the second row, first row, <laughs> zeroth row. So, um, something else to do in your cover letter. If you were referred to the position by someone at the company or someone who knows the hiring manager, mention it there. Drop names for crying out loud, because I'm gonna go to that person, I'm gonna go, hey, Julie, Steven just applied for this thing. What'd you think of him? You know, yeah, see, <laughs> she knows Steven. Um, so put that in your cover letter, it's really useful. And the closing sentence paragraph of your letter should be a firm statement of wanting to talk to me. All right, don't be ambivalent, let them know you want this job, not just any job, I don't care if you did just send out 50 applications, Make me think you want this job, not just any job. Something like, I don't know, I'm looking forward to speaking with you soon to figure out how I can help the team even more. I don't know, make up some sort of bullshit like that. <laughs> it's a spade. So um, that's your cover letter. You've got it written, you've got it ready to go. Now you actually have to apply for the job. There's not a lot of tips here, but there are some. First of all, aside from maybe an automated email when you submit, Odds are really good you're never going to hear back from that company again. I'm sorry. Um, some studies show that up to 75%, if not more, of the applications you send in go to DevNull. You never hear back from them one way or another. This is incredibly disrespectful behavior on the part of hiring companies. Let me stress that. It is disrespectful on their part. It is not you. It is them. If you don't hear back from a company at all, it's not that you are no good, right? It's that they fail at respect and communication. It's not you, it is them. Do you find a lot of companies still do that? Could, yes, they do. Uh, could you please hold that for the end? 
I'm sorry. Um, so uh, you're going to find that the majority of companies now use online application and applicant tracking software. Um, what comp this means is that you'll often get a URL where you can check your status of your application. Please don't use or lose, you definitely use, but don't lose this URL. Some companies believe that just because you have that URL, it um, means they don't have to contact you. They don't have to communicate with you because you get to go out and get the information. Again, still disrespectful, but it, that also means that this may be the only way you have of checking in on things. When applying, always, always, always follow application directions. Don't get clever and go outside the process. Just don't. Follow the process and then get clever by finding people inside who can you know, advocate for you. If you don't follow the process, then what I see as a hiring manager is someone who can't follow directions. And why in the hell would I hire you? Just, I don't care how stupid they are, follow the damn directions. I sometimes get asked um, when and how often you should check in on an application, and the answer is don't. If you've got the URL, check the URL. If you have a friend who recommended you, then check with your friend. You know, you can do that, that's fine. But otherwise, if you just submit an application, I'm sorry, they didn't bother to write to you in the first place. What makes you think they're going to get back to you if you're checking in? They're not, just don't check in. It's, you don't need that kind of aggravation. All right, like I said, just a few tips for that because now we get onto the interesting stuff. Somebody has called you and you get an interview, OMG. So there's a lot of different kinds of interviews, as we all know, you've got your phone screens, your technical, your on-site. Um, before I get into specific tips for those, here are some general tips that apply to all of them. First of all is research, research, research. I can't say this often enough at every step in the process. Do a lot of research. The company, the industry, the product, the people, news about all of the above. Research the typical salary for that role in that ge geographic area. All right? Be prepared and review this information before any and or all interviews. Dress comfortably but professionally, and yes, this even means for phone interviews. You would not believe the confidence boost you get from sitting there looking good, right? So always dress nicely for interviews. Um, nice, there's typically no need to put on a suit. If somebody shows up t uh, for my team in a suit for an interview, I'm gonna think they're trying a little too hard, but that's why I typically have my recruiters say, hey, just wear something comfortable. We make sure to tell them in advance. Not everyone does. Um, regardless what you wear, make sure it fits well and it makes you feel good. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there fidgeting. Don't do that because you'll be uncomfortable and it comes across in the interview. Everything should be neat, tidy, and have a well put together look. Prepare questions. Oh my God, for the love of dog, do this. Right? When the interviewer asks, do you have any questions for me, the answer is always yes. You can reuse the questions with multiple interviewers, that's fine, but always prepare at least five questions in advance, if not more. Always have these ready. Don't expect you're going to have time to get them all answered, but have them. As well, you've prepared those questions, but also ask questions during the interview process. If you don't understand something, ask. If you're curious about it, ask. If you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. This is a dialogue, this is a two-way street. So feel free to turn it into that. And don't be afraid to say, I don't know. I'm looking around this room and none of us, none of us are omniscient. There are plenty of things we all don't know. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. However, when you do it, follow up with, but here's how I would find out. That way you're showing me that you have some good thinking skills, you've got resources that you'll use, and that you're not afraid to say, I don't know. That means if, I, if you're afraid to say, I don't know, you're gonna be coding in a corner for hours and days and days on something without asking for help. That doesn't look good for me. So, please be on time, absolutely, positively. Where on time is five minutes early. You can go up to 10, but five is good. Um, your interviewer is almost definitely going to be late, but you are not. Uh, so let me see, even if that means getting to the building 30 minutes early, sitting in your car, that's fine. Take notes during and or after each interview. Take notes about to whom you spoke, what was asked and answered. These are going to come in really handy later on as you're reviewing your research. These become part of your research. Don't skip this. Even if you think you have the most amazing memory you don't, write it down. 
Right, so those generally apply to most interviews. Let's talk about the phone screen. Phone screen is typically conducted by HR or a recruiter. The primary purpose of it is to make sure you are an actual human being who can interact for the most part. Are you a nice person? Can you communicate? You know, basic things like that. Some of the common questions that you should be prepared to answer during a phone screen. Are you willing to relocate? Even if you put it on your cover letter, they always ask. Why are you leaving your current position? What do you know about our company? What is your current or expected salary? Just, yeah. Do not tell them your current salary. It is none of their goddamn business and it has no relevance whatsoever to this conversation. Don't tell them. However, you can't refuse to answer the question. It is valid for them. They do have to know whether you are out of their budget. So therefore, what do you do? Here's where all that salary research pays off. Because now you can say, well, according to my research, this position pays between X and Y. I think I'm expecting anything within that range in this. You've just answered it. Boom, question answered. You've maintained the privacy of your financial information. They have the information you need. You've hidden the information they don't need. So let's say you get past the phone screen. You may have a phone interview. Um, this is a more advanced version of the phone screen. Um, it's often by the hiring manager. Sometimes it'll be more technical in nature, sometimes more conceptual. Regardless, this is where the real questions start coming up. So therefore, hey, guess what? Be prepared. Review your research. Do more research. Review your cover letter. Review the job posting. The more you know, the more prepared you are. And the more prepared you are, the more confident you are when you walk into that room. So you get past the phone screen. At some point, they're going to want to see you. You'll have an on-site interview. Shit just got real, people. Now you're sitting in a room with people. Some companies do multiples of these, some only one, some will be all day, some will just be an hour, some will include lunch, some will include drinks. You know, it's all over the board, but there are some tips which will help no matter what, such as plan ahead. What is the route to the office? Do you know how to get there? Do you know how long it takes to get there? Do you have a plan B in case, I don't know, Muni gets stuck in the tunnel again? Um, you know, Figure out all of these things. If possible, take the trip in advance so you can really think about it. Plan in advance. Figure out where you're going to park. You know, figure out where you can get a stiff drink afterwards if things don't go well. Think these things through. As well, leave home early, arrive early. Try not to be too early again. Five minutes is great. Ten is OK. More than that puts a burden on the people that you're going to visit, and they have to figure out what the fuck to do with you. So try not to be more than ten minutes early if you can. Be Absolutely nice to everyone. I don't care if it's the housekeeper or the VP of sales. On a normal average day, they deserve the exact same respect. On this day in particular, you're going to be all sunshine and puppy dogs and light to everyone. I typically, often, if I can arrange it, I'll have somebody, a junior from another department, not even engineering, meet people. And then I'm going to pump them for information. How they treat you? What questions did they ask? Right. So be nice to everyone. Everyone in there is interviewing you in some way. Be careful what you eat and drink. Absolutely do eat beforehand, because if you're sitting in that room and you're hungry, that is distracting as fuck, and you're just not going to interview very well. So eat beforehand, you know, some sort of high protein thing. If there is a meal or drink component to the interview, be very careful. Be selective of what you order. Nothing messy, nothing risky, say spicy or garlicky or something like that. Nothing high alcohol if coffee makes you hyper. Ting, then get tea. You have a brain and good sense. Please use it. And then at the end, please send a thank you email the next day. Do not send snail mail. Oh my god, how desperate does that come across as? Very. Please don't send snail mail. It's creepy. Um, so just a really quick uh, thank you for your time. If you have some questions that you need answered as well, include those in there. And that helps to keep them engaged and show that you're engaged. So that's useful as well. Um, always end it with a statement that you're interested in continuing the conversation. Right? A lot of people don't do that. But as a hiring manager, I wonder, do you want to keep going with this conversation? I typically will ask at the end, hey, are you cool with this? Do you want to keep going? But you know, it's still nice to hear again. Oh, they liked me. They really liked me. Um, we're going to start going even faster, if you can believe. So you've done, done the interviews. You've got the offer. You're sitting there. Now what? Always assume you're going to negotiate the offer. I can't speak for everyone, but I, as a hiring manager, I'm going to make you the absolute best offer I possibly can. Often there's wiggle room. 
Often not. Regardless, I expect that somebody's going to come back and negotiate. I might not be able to do anything, but I still expect them to ask. There's lots of stuff you can negotiate for besides just salary. There's PTO, there's new hardware, there's work from home, there's flexible hours, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. But assume for now that I'm just going to talk about salary. We expect you to negotiate, but we do not like you being obviously greedy. Negotiate, but do so in good faith. You have to work with these people afterward, for crying out loud. All right, don't be a greedy pig, don't be a jerk. The best and most effective negotiations are those which are win-win. So, you did all that salary research a while back, refresh it. You've learned more stuff about the, the position, you've learned the title may have changed, who knows? Go back, make sure your information about the salary still works. Refresh it. Because you're gonna need that data. You only, only, I know, isn't that great? <laughs> David is so gonna, David, Stephen's gonna hit me later. Um, so only work from data, not from feelings. I don't care if you feel you are worth $30,000 more a year. If the data doesn't show it, don't ask for it, right? Just don't, only work from data, not from feelings. Um, it's really empowering and, and powerful to say my research shows that. My feeling is that is powerful in a different way, in a different context, not in negotiations for salary. Beyond data, you also absolutely positively have to prove you're worth the higher salary for which you are negotiating. Don't just ask for more money, tell them why you're worth it. So considering my experience with JavaScript, um, Docker, and I know Nginx that you use, I can get up and running really fast as well. I know your domain space already, so I'm gonna be effective more quickly than these other people. That's why I think I'm worth another $25,000 a year. You know, tell me why. Tell me why you're asking for money. Otherwise, you just look greedy. Please always get this shit in writing. Do it over email if you can. If you're talking to people face to face, send a corroborating email and have them reply back. Yes, this is what we agreed on. Get this shit in writing. Also, Always be excited about the opportunity. Do not give me an ultimatum and don't make me think you're doing that either. If you have made it this far through the process, you obviously want the job, right? So tell me that. Say something like, thank you so much for the offer. I'm really looking forward to joining the team. There's just a few things I'd like to work out in advance. Boom, start negotiating. But tell me that. Don't give me an ultimatum, be excited. I said it once already. Make the negotiation a win-win. Everyone should feel they are getting good value at the end of it. Whoo, we're moving. Yeah, we might skip some slides soon. So before starting that negotiation, know what you absolutely will not accept. Unless you have to keep food in the mouths of your children and a roof over your head, never accept an offer for a job that is, black, that is lowballing you. Never. Just don't. But if you have to keep your mortgage paid, if you have to pay your kids, you know, then accept whatever you need to do. You know, just get it done. All right. There's a whole bunch here about uh, organizing. I have two minutes. Hmm. Let's see what we can do. So, most people aren't going to tell you about this sort of shit, but it's incredibly important. The process is chaotic enough as it is. Why add more chaos to it by being disorganized? You remember all that preparation and that research? How are you gonna find it? You need to stay organized. You're going to get calls out of the blue from recruiters thinking that you are the, theirs is the only position you have applied for and they're just gonna start talking to you as though you know what the fuck they're talking about and you don't. So you have to be really organized so you can find that information very quickly. There's lots of stuff you should uh, track. There's the obvious shit like the company name and the name of the position, the date you applied, that URL I mentioned earlier. Um, contact information for the people. Then there's the less obvious ones. For instance, as you apply for things, please make PDF printouts of every job for which you apply because when you least expect it, that shit goes AWOL. And when you do get that call from that recruiter going, hey, we're talking about the director of software engineering for FUBAR, and you're like, hmm, what even is that? Now you can find it because you will have your own hard copy of this stuff. As well, if you are sending customized cover letters and resumes, and again, I do recommend you do that, make sure you're tracking that with, along with any other information for that specific position, because you're gonna wanna know what you said, for crying out loud. If the application asks specific questions, ask, track the questions and your answers to them so you can refer back to them later on. They're gonna be looking at it, why shouldn't you? 
And then there is also every single contact you have with a company, every email, every phone call, all the notes, all the hands you shook and the babies you kissed. You have to track that somewhere. Um, my recommendation for doing this, you will have your own. Mine is Trello. Oh my fucking God, Trello. Ah, it's like a ray of sunshine. Um, it Actually, you can see here, it scrolls all the way down. Um, gathering info, applied, phone screen, first interview, second interview, up and down here I've got declined and withdrew and various other things. Each one of these cards can contain comments where you can track each and every single thing that was said. You also can attach files to each and every single card, which is great. So let's say that PDF, you put it right here, everything is searchable. You can find all the shit. It is just amazing for job hunts. It puts everything in one spot. It's great. I love it. So I recommend you use that. Um, ooh, I'm over time. I'm so sorry. But we've got some quick resources. Um, first of all, this video right here that I am capturing will go up on Internet Archive along with my slides and my speaker's notes because, as you can see, my slides are shit without speaker's notes. So you can look all this stuff up. That will probably be, I don't know, tomorrow, later this week. Watch for Twitter. Um, Aside from that, more resources. Landing the Tech Job You Love by Andy Lester. Andy is a good friend of mine, but aside from that, he writes great books. This is an amazing book. Get it. There is Hiring Geeks That Fit by Johanna Rothman. This is from my point of view. This is from the hiring manager's point of view. But you know, know your enemy. So get this book, read it. You can see how things are supposed to be going. If you're doing any negotiation, either here or anywhere else in life, and we all do, Please, for the love of dog, read this book, Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and William Urry. And then there's a couple of blogs which are super useful. One is Ask the Headhunter, Nick Corcadillos. Um, he is an actual headhunter, not the kind that will stew you in a pot, but the kind who will help find you a job. So he answers lots of interesting questions. Um, and then there is Allison Green, Ask a Manager. She's coming more from the... Uh, more from the HR point of view, and not all the things she answers are about job hunting, but she does give a lot of really good information, so I recommend you look her up. And then there is me. I am probably going to have a, uh, an unconference session on Friday where you can sit in a room and ask me all sorts of questions, not only about job hunts, but anything else you want. Uh, you know, my own little ask the manager. So um, you can find me here if you have any questions. And again, Freenode, which I didn't update this slide with, is just VM Brasur. So if you do the IRC thing rather than the Slack thing, then you can find me there. Um, this is the slide for questions, but unfortunately, we are two minutes and 23 seconds over time. So find me around the conference.